This video is part one of chapter 17, and in this chapter, we're going to discuss how you get from a gene to a phenotype, otherwise known as gene expression. We already know that the information found in genes is based on the sequence of nucleotides. We also know that DNA inherited by an organism leads to specific traits, and it does this by dictating the synthesis of proteins. <clears throat> proteins are the links between genotype and phenotype. And in the process of gene expression, DNA directs protein synthesis in two stages, transcription and translation. How was this discovered? Well, the fundamental relationship between genes and proteins was discovered in a variety of ways. And we'll look at, a, at at least one of those different ways. What was found that is that genes specify proteins via the processes of transcription and translation. George Beadle and Edward Tatum worked with bread mold and mutated them with x-rays so that they were unable to survive on food uh, media that didn't have supplements. And what they found was that the different mutants had deficiencies in different enzymes that were parts of metabolic pathways. So what they developed was a one gene, one enzyme hypothesis which states that each gene dictates the production of a specific enzyme. It's really more um, accurate to say that one gene dictates the production of one polypeptide because not all proteins are enzymes, okay? And in fact, it's more common to refer to the gene products as proteins rather than polypeptides because proteins are what lead to and produce the phenotype. So let's look at transcription and translation in general. We're going to get into more detail of each of the processes later in this chapter. RNA is the bridge between genes which are made of DNA and the proteins for which they code. The first step to get to RNA is transcription and that is defined as the synthesis of RNA using information in DNA. What transcription produces is a molecule of RNA called messenger RNA. It's called that because it contains the message of the gene. The reason that RNA is needed as an intermediate in gene expression is because DNA never leaves the nucleus. So there has to be some sort of a messenger to get the message out of the nucleus. <clears throat> Once the RNA is produced, it will go through the process of translation, which is the synthesis of a polypeptide using information found in the messenger RNA. And the cellular structure that performs translation are, is the ribosome. So ribosomes are considered to be the sites of translation. If we compare transcription and translation in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, it all happens together in one place because in the prokaryotes because they don't have a nucleus. But in a eukaryotic cell, transcription occurs in the nucleus and then translation occurs in the cytoplasm. In fact, the messenger RNA is not the immediate molecule that's produced in transcription. The immediate molecule is called the primary transcript and it's going to be processed prior to undergoing translation. The reason we call it this is because there's a lot of pieces in the RNA that come from the DNA that as far as we know don't really do anything. Okay. Now we could characterize this entire process as what's called the central dogma of biology or the central principle of biology and that's that Cells are governed by what we call a cellular chain of command. DNA, which is the basic information and the blueprint information, dictates the production of RNA, which is the transcript of the information, which then dictates the production of a protein. We could extend this and add another arrow here and put phenotype, because it's the protein that's going to determine the phenotype. <clears throat> Here's just another diagrammatic representation of this process. Now, how does the genetic code get translated into proteins? Well, we know that proteins are made up of amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids that are possible to be put into proteins. But there are actually only four nucleotides, and we already know that we've talked about that before. So how do we get nucleotides to correspond to an amino acid if that's what we're trying to produce here? We're taking the information in the sequence of nucleotides and converting it into a sequence of amino acids through the processes of transcription and translation. Well, it was discovered through a lot of research that the flow of information from gene to protein is based on what is called a triplet code. That is to say that 
three nucleotides in a row represent the information that's going to be used to code for an amino acid in a protein. So they're, the three nucleotides are really the words of a gene. And they'll be transcribed into RNA first from the DNA, and then they'll be translated into the chain of amino acids forming a polypeptide during translation. Here's how that works. Here's the DNA template strand, and in fact only one strand of the DNA is used as the information for the process of gene expression. So transcription produces RNA using complementary base pairing rules from the primary DNA template strand to the transcript. So notice here that where there's an adenine in DNA, the complementary base in RNA is a U or a uracil. If you remember from a while ago, way back in chapter 5, we talked about the differences between DNA and RNA. And then C and G pair up normally. And then wherever there's a T in the DNA, you would get an A in the RNA. Notice that RNA is single-stranded. That's another difference in RNA. And then when the RNA is translated, it is translated by reading, the ribosome reads three bases at a time, and these are translated into specific amino acids. <coughs> As I stated before, only one of the two DNA strands provides the information to form the RNA transcript. And the template strand is always the same strand for any given gene. And again, during translation, the messenger RNA base triplets, which are called codons, that's a good vocabulary word for us, are read in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. We talked a little bit about that in DNA. This is very, very important for understanding how translation works. And then each codon specifies which amino acid is going to be placed in order in the building of the polypeptide. Now, since there are three bases in a codon, there are a total of 64 possible codons. And these were deciphered in the mid-1960s. We're not going to go into a lot of the detail of that. Um, <clears throat> of the 64 codons, 61 actually code for amino acids, and then three are what we call stop codons or stop signals. We'll get to that in a minute. One thing interesting about the genetic code is that it is redundant. What that means is more than one codon may specify a single amino acid. We'll see that in the chart here in a second. But no codon specifies more than one amino acid. In addition, when the ribosome reads the codon, they must be read in the correct order, or what is called the correct reading frame, or correct groupings of bases in the RNA, in order for the specified polypeptide to be produced correctly. Here's the genetic code. Notice that the amino acids are abbreviated in three letters. So if a codon is UUU in the messenger RNA, the ribosome is going to translate into a phenylalanine or translate that information into a phenylalanine. Okay, notice there's also a codon called the start codon. AUG is always where the ribosome is going to start reading. We'll get to that more later. But it does represent an amino acid called methionine. You can see here, like for instance, for proline, which is PRO, all the codon needs to be is CC first, and then the, four, the third base in the codon doesn't really matter, you're always going to get proline. The genetic code is nearly universal. What that means is all organisms transcribe and translate the genetic code in the same way. This is one of the major pieces of evidence that supports the, the, the scientific theory of evolution that organisms are related. In fact, genes can also be transcribed and translated after being transplanted from one species to another. <clears throat> what that means is a gene from any organism can be expressed in any other organism. Here's some examples of that. Here's a tobacco plant that's had a firefly gene inserted into it. Now the tobacco plant gl glows. And then here's a pig that has a sea jelly gene or a jellyfish gene for bioluminescence, which means it glows, and it turns the pig green. Now let's take a closer look at transcription, which is the first step in, in gene expression. Let's first look at the molecular components of the machinery, and then we'll get into the process. RNA synthesis is catalyzed by a pro, an enzyme called RNA polymerase. We've seen polymerases before in DNA replication. When the process occurs, what happens is RNA polymerase will split apart the DNA strands and then begin building the complementary RNA that is compl the complementary RNA strand to the DNA template strand. And it follows the same basic base pairing rules except the uracil substitutes for thymine. 
Here's what that looks like. There are three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. There's usually a promoter region prior to the beginning of the information in the gene. That's where RNA polymerase is going to bind. It's going to split apart the DNA double helix and then begin building the RNA transcript. So in, in initiation, RNA polymerase pulls apart the DNA. In elongation, it builds the RNA transcript. In termination, it reaches the end of the gene and it knows where the end is because there's a certain sequence of bases there that the, that the RNA polymerase recognizes. And then you have a completed RNA transcript. Okay, we talked about the promoter. And this is usually in bacteria. We see a promoter, but we also see it in, in eukaryotes. And then also in bacteria, there's a terminator section at the end of the gene. Don't really see a lot of that in eukaryotes. Okay, we call the stretch of DNA that's transcribed the transcription unit. And as I mentioned, there's three stages. There's initiation, elongation, and termination. And we'll review those again. So in elongation, the promoter is the starting point where RNA polymerase is going to bind. Okay? And then it, it forms what is called the transcription initiation complex. And it begins the process of transcription. Okay, we see that here. Here's the promoter region. The RNA polymerase is going to bind in addition to a few other molecules, don't worry about those, and then it's going to unwind the DNA double helix. Then when elongation happens, RNA polymerase moves along, bringing in new RNA bases to complementary pair to the DNA template strand, building the exact, an exact copy, well, a complementary copy of the RNA from the DNA. And here's what that looks like. So here's RNA polymerase. You can see that base pairs that are complementary to the DNA are being brought in and bonded together. And then lastly, the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator in bacteria or it reaches a particular sequence in eukaryotes and that signifies the end of the transcript. Now, we already know that this RNA molecule is just the primary transcript and it's not ready to go yet. It's not exactly perfect and ready to go for translation. So there are enzymes that are going to modify the RNA through a process called RNA processing. What happens is both ends are altered and then portions inside are cut out and split together. So the ends are altered by the 5', five prime end receiving a modified 5' prime cap, it's usually a guanine, and then the 3' prime end gets a bunch of adenines added to it, what we call a poly A tail. And these modifications serve a variety of functions. One is they help to export the messenger RNA to the cytoplasm. They protect it, and they also help ribosomes find the 5' prime end. So we can see here the modified cap and then the poly A tail. The next thing that happens is that parts of the RNA are cut out. Most eukaryotic genes in their RNA transcripts have long regions that don't code for anything. We don't really know what they do yet. Those non-coding regions are called introns. The other regions that are expressed are called the exons. So what happens is called RNA splicing. What this does is it removes the introns, get rid of, gets rid of them, and then joins the exons together, creating the mRNA molecule that is ready to go into translation. 